listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Vuelta a España in association with Rafa. Today we are in Málaga. Hello and welcome to Malaga or Malaga as they would say in Spain. My name's Lionel Burney and you're joining the Cycling Podcast for three weeks. Grand Tour coverage from the Vuelta a España, the final Grand Tour of the season. I've arrived, I've collected my uh, my accreditation pass, which means that I can get inside the Vuelta bubble. I've got my stickers to put on the hire car. And uh, just as I parked up here, I pulled in next to a couple of cars from Welcome to Yorkshire, who are going to be part of the publicity caravan here at the Vuelta. And the strongest clue yet that the rumours that Yorkshire will host the start of the Vuelta uh, sometime soon uh, well, that's going to come true. I wouldn't be surprised if it was as early as 2020, but we're here in Andalusia. I can just about see the sea. It's the opening prologue time trial. Well, no, it's not a prologue. It's the opening stage one time trial. And I need to find my partner in not crime for the next eight days, Fran Reyes. So I'll go and find Fran and the Vuelta can get underway. And here he is, Spanish cycling journalist Fran Reyes. Welcome to the Cycling Podcast. Welcome, Lionel, to my home. Welcome to the city where I studied my journalism degree in university. Every pothole in this city. Should we discover it? We should. Well, we should go and see if we can catch the first rider starting the time trial. It's around about five o'clock in the afternoon here. The time trial will be going on into the evening. I think the last rider, Vincenzo Nibali, is off at half past eight and uh, due to finish at half past eight. So he actually rolls down the ramp at 21 minutes past eight Spanish time. Very warm here, Fran. I'm a bit overdressed. I've come come in jeans. I might need to put some shorts on. Good thing is that you are wearing full black kid and that's elegant. That makes you look thin. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, as but as for the rest, it was a pretty bad pick for the outfit. You know, uh, some people is wearing really flip flops, so you might join that club. Well, I haven't got any flip flops, but I have got some shorts. But let's get down to the start and see if we can find the Vuelta a España. Well, Fran, that was. Dylan Van Bala, I think, of uh, Team Sky, Dutch national time trial champion, just rolling off the start ramp there. Just before him was Richie Port, BMC's leader. We know, well, the last couple of days he's announced that he's definitely joining Trek Segafredo next season, and also he has an upset stomach, so not not in 100% best condition for the start of the Vuelta here. It's always something with uh, Richie Port. It's a shame because... One can only feel for him because he seems to be like the most unlucky of the GC contenders in the world. Richard said to me before I came out here to Spain that he doesn't think Port will last the first week. I'm not sure. I mean, I can see where he's coming from there. You don't want to start a a race with any kind of physical problem. And it won't won't be easy the first few days, will it? He's clearly starting in the back foot. But I don't think the first week of La Vuelta is that difficult this year so maybe he can make it through it without losing too much time and without losing his GC options all of his GC options I mean he has time to lose them further down the road well we're here in Malaga just uh, behind the start here it's the Pompidou Centre uh, it's a kind of glass or plastic kind of patchwork design of, of uh, coloured glass or coloured plastic quite a striking looking building a lot of artwork on display in there and we're down in the port area just behind us here is the port I'm quite surprised to see just how industrial the port looks here Port of Malaga has always been an industrial hotbed but uh, in the modern times like in the last decade it has been kind of uh, divided in two sections here uh, on the left side where the all the right the team are parked that's the industrial side and from here on from the start line to the right that's the pier one which is a kind of luxury magazine luxury restaurant place it has been recently rebuilt and nowadays it's quite fancy for people that has more money than me 
<laughs> so Malaga has a, a it has an old part to the city, but also it attracts the tourists. I mean, I'm I'm noticing here uh, Burger King and KFC, but uh, also a, a little bit more high end type places there. It looks like um, it's perhaps a little bit above Torremolinos in terms of the type of people it might attract uh, on on a holiday. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, after all. Uh in Malaga, there has always been a lot of foreign tourism. Most of the high-end tourism, as you described it earlier, was uh, located exclusively in uh, Marbella. But as years have gone by, it has begun to be spread towards the whole western coastline of Malaga. And that has arrived also to the city, which is in a process of being more modern, so to speak, losing part of its usual soul to become more profitable. So the opening weekend here, um, well, the opening few days are all based very close to Malaga, aren't they? We'll be going to Marbella, in fact. That's a huge tourist destination, of course. But it's concentrated in this area of Andalusia, a little bit like a grand part of the Tour de France would concentrate in one area. I just wonder, you know, what's the kind of significance of the Malaga area and, and the opening few days being hosted in Andalusia? Because this area has become very popular for the Vuelta in the last few years. Basically, there is this uh, saying, you know, that... Uh, when uh, whatever the popular party of Spain, which is basically the right-wing party, is ruling, the Vuelta will go. And uh, here in uh, Malaga, the province of Malaga, is one of the strongest headquarters for the right-wing party. So yeah, it, uh, that's why it makes sense for it to come every, I don't know, three, four years. Because I remember recently a uh, grand party thing it was in uh, 2014 from Marbella itself. And uh, yeah, yeah that, that is how it uh, works with the uh, Vuelta España. But of course, there are always the parts and the arrivals in uh, different cities that are ruled by a different party. But well, <laughs> why, why is that then? Why would, a, why would the right wing party in Spain be more interested in having the Vuelta, having a sporting event like this, than the left wing parties? Is it because the left wing don't want to spend the money on something as uh, kind of frivolous as a cycling event? No, I think that's a matter of network. After all, uh, we are as important as the people we know. And I feel that uh, for some reason, the people that have been ruling the world for ages already, they might be better connected to the right-wing people than to the left-wing. But I think it's coincident. I don't think there is any policy behind that. It's, as far as I am aware, it's just an anecdote. It's not a political trend. So it's just a coincidence then. Okay, um, now this is the first time there's been an individual time trial since I think 2009 to kick off the Vuelta. Why has there been the change? Because in the last few years, the team time trial has been a very popular start for um, the opening stage. Well, I guess that's related because of uh, to the beauties that uh, is a stage wants to showcase. It begins in Pier 1 with, and Centre Pompidou, which are two of the biggest bets from Malaga as a city to attract tourism and it ends up on um, Calle Larios which is the main street of the city and uh, both places have logistical limitations when it comes to host a cycling race road stage would be pretty much impossible to be ended up in Calle Larios and a time trial will be very challenging because there is just enough room as to, as to get nine riders or eight riders into the finish line so um, individual time trial made more sense. So it's a city centre kind of circuit, isn't it? And uh, well, well, we'll go wandering, I think, and I think we'll end up up at the finish line. We'll walk into the centre there to the main street of Malaga and uh, go and see what's happening at the finish. Yeah, let's go. From grand tours to group rides, the Champs-Élysées to coffee shops, Rafa exists to celebrate the world's most beautiful sport. Thank you very much to Rafa for sponsoring the cycling podcast. 
their support enables us to cover all three grand tours of the season and uh, it's thanks to them and also science and sport and our friends of the podcast that we're here in Malaga and we'll be following the race all the way round to its conclusion uh, doing a bit of a tag team effort this time I'll be here until the first rest day and then Richard will come in for the second two weeks of the race just while I'm mentioning Rafa if you would like to sign up for the Rafa Women's 100 in association with the cycling podcast you can do so it, the ride is on Saturday the 15th of September and it's going to be led by one of our listeners Hannah Nicholas it starts in uh, South London at the Cadence store you need to go to rafa.cc and click on events to find out all the details but it starts at 9 o'clock in the morning and it's a 100 kilometre ride and yes there are a few uh, cafe stops on the way um, and it should be a great day out now I've split with Fran here Um, he's gone in one direction I've gone in another but before we reunite Let's just hear a little bit from Richie Port, the BMC leader, riding his final Grand Tour for BMC. Uh, Struck down with a touch of gastroenteritis a few days before the Vuelta and clearly not feeling his best. Uh, This was his reaction to his opening time trial ride. I mean, it's terrible. It felt absolutely shocking. It's been hard to be motivated for it. It's, uh, It's nice to start the race. And how has your condition progressed over the last few days? Are you getting better? I'm not sure. I guess really tomorrow is the big, the big test. Tomorrow and the next day, was, like I said before, it's just nice to finally get the race started. Um, you know, I think the lead up to the Grand Tours is always a little bit stressful, sitting around and not really training properly. And plus, I got a little bit sick, so uh, it hasn't been ideal. But it's just great to start. Is Monday kind of the date you've got in your mind, or the day you've got in your mind for when you might feel better again? I hope so. Um, you know, to Nice finish. Also, tomorrow is pretty solid little finish, so we'll see, but we've got other cards we can play as well, so um, should be good. Yeah, it's a pretty straightforward course, really. It's a couple of little corners. You have to be a little bit careful. Obviously, there's quite a lot of traffic on these roads, so um, you know, it's a little bit slippery, but the climb's not really much to worry about, but it uh, should be a good course. Hopefully, a, a Rowan Dennis course. What about your shoulder? I felt absolutely awful, to be honest, but... Uh, I guess that's always going to be. I mean, the tour was bitterly disappointing. It's not been a straightforward run-in, but uh, you know, I look forward to building on the form uh, for world championships in this race. I'm now in the centre of Malaga, outside an ice cream parlour, so the holiday Grand Tour vibe is really kicking in now, and I'm with Daniel, Daniel Freeb. Hello. How's it going? Not bad, not bad. Yeah. L- I landed in Malaga this afternoon been a bit hectic getting here picking up my hire car and so on hitting the ground running really no helado no ice cream for you Lionel not just yet no I'll, I'll wait maybe have one after dinner I'm staying down here in the town you're up in the hills somewhere yeah we bailed on our city centre apartment the siren call of the hills was too irresistible no in actual fact we couldn't park our car it was impossible to park in central Malaga so we had to had to make a change but very happy very happy where we are Lionel we're near um, on the road towards Antiquara. What have you gleaned so far? We're probably approaching two-thirds of the way through the opening time trial now. As we speak, Dylan Van Bala is the only rider to have gone under 10 minutes. His time of 9.59 stands firm. That was set very early on because I actually saw Van Bala roll out roll down the start ramp earlier on a couple of BMC riders very close behind him Alessandro De Marchi and Dylan Toynes another BMC rider in the top six as it stands Brent Bookwalter and uh, well the, the the stage win is still up for grabs um, there's quite a few big name riders still to come what do you reckon do you think Van Bala's time is going to stand no, I would say it's not. Uh, I think uh, Rowan Dennis is, was a, the pre-race favourite and based on what people are saying about the course, he's an even stronger favourite now than he was at the start of the day. It's a, it's a fast course and riders not going to touch the brakes very much. However, I would say that, that we should look out for and um, be very wary of Victor Campanet, um, who generally goes better in lo- slightly longer time trials than this one. However... Um, a couple of, couple of curious things I've learned about his time trial today. Um, he is running a 60 tooth um, single chain ring bike, um, which is quite unusual. Um, he also, I think he came to wreck the course in April. Um, he was in Malaga um, for some other reason. At that point, he didn't think he was going to do the Vuelta. 
but just on a whim for the sh- sheer fun of it he looked up online where the prologue of the world was going to take place and he went to wreck the course at that time back in april um the course it was it was supposed to be well, it was going to be a slightly different course the climb was going to be a bit longer so he actually wrecked a different different course however he was down to ride the tour of britain um, and not do the welter he then started looking more closely at the tour of britain route he had thought that there was a, an individual time trial in the Tour of Britain that was going to suit him. He then realised that it was not an individual time trial, it was a team time trial. Um, he flagged this up to his team management and they said, oh, well, maybe there might be a spot at the Vuelta after all. Um, and then Thomas Marshinsky, who won two stages at last year's uh, Vuelta, pulled out, um, thus freeing a space for Campanets. And um, yeah, here he is. And he's the European time trial champion, so we'll see him in his blue-grey star-adorned jersey a little bit later on. Is he still? Yeah, he won it in Glasgow the other week. Did he win it the year before that as well? Good question. Off the top of my head, can't remember. No, uh, did he? Did he? Well, he's definitely the champion now. So, yeah, I think you're right. Campanet could be... Well, he's one of the favourites, but I, I'm with you. I think Rowan Dennis... Uh, will be in the red jersey at the end of the day. Well, you know me, I don't particularly like speculation, but I've, I've put it all on Dennis there. Of course, he was in red at the end of the first stage last year, the team time trial in Nîmes that started the Vuelta. It will be interesting to see if he gets into a good position overall, whether he rides for an overall position here, as he as he kind of did at the at the Giro. He kind of rode as a GC rider, even though he was losing time in the, in the last week. Um, so he's certainly one to watch. Anyone else that you think we should be looking for how do you think Quintana and Nibali are going to do on this course because it is it's kind of a traditional out and back isn't it it's uh, around hugs the kind of the not quite the coastline but it's there's a bit of beach off the rider's shoulders it's a kind of a British time trial course really isn't it I wouldn't I wouldn't really know I'm not really that familiar with British time trial courses like um, however I would suggest they do pretty badly but doing badly does not mean losing a lot of time because I don't think anyone is going to lose that much time and um, just going back to what you were saying about Rowan Dennis um, I think any ambiguity or, or uncertainty about um, who BMC is going to put their weight behind well that that question might be cleared up slightly in the next few days because Richie Port we know that he was ill before the race um, he's making some very pessimistic noises um, about well not only his condition at the moment but how he's prepared for this race and um, he doesn't seem in a particularly good frame of mind understandably um, and who knows you know he he could decide that he's here to prepare the world championships and and perhaps go for a stage win but not much else and thus freeing the way for Rowan Dennis to have another tilt at a, at a major tour. Yeah it's always interesting isn't it a 10 minute effort you can see you can glean a few little um, pointers who's going well who's not going well but nothing's going to be won or lost uh, in a in a time trial like this it's really just a kind of a it's like sifting flour isn't it just sorts everybody out gets them into some kind of order before the road stages start tomorrow i'm impressed with malaga i've got to say it's uh, it's got quite a nice vibe it's um it's obviously very popular with holiday makers um, not just from abroad but also from Spain but it's got obviously w- w- some of these towns have been taken over by um, tourists in the last 40 years I'm thinking Tor- Torremolinos, Fuengirola um, a bit further along Marbella. the coast Marbella, Marbella. Yeah. whereas Malaga feels like a Spanish town it certainly does here yeah it does and there's a, a real mix of different types of tourists as well um, there's luxury tourism there's sort of more low budget tourism um, and the tourists cohabit coexist with um, as you say the sort of living working folk um, in Malaga which makes for quite an interesting mix The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport Whether you're grinding up the French Alps or just taking your mates on around a local loop Science in Sport Rego Rapid Recovery Plus will help you recover faster after your ride, so you're ready to go again the next day. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science in Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. If you would like to get 25% off all Science in Sport products, you can go to scienceinsport.com and when you check out, enter the code SISCP25. Slightly distracted because 
two stars of Spanish cycling are within touching distance almost of me. One, Fran Reyes, who rejoins me here at the ice cream parlour, and the other is Alejandro Valverde of Movistar, who has uh, finished his time trial, I think, a little bit down on the leading times. Uh, but one of his teammates, Nelson Oliveira, is in the hot seat at the moment, Fran. Nine minutes 56, he's beaten Dylan Bambala's time by three seconds. Nelson Oliveira, making up for the disappointment of being left out of the Tour de France lineup of Movistar team last minute to enter Marc Soler. Very strong rider, very good domestic and a really good time trialist. Really underrated cyclist. Fourth in the World Time Trial Championships in Bergen last year, so obviously had pedigree over a lot longer distance and a tougher course than this, but clearly going very well if he's pulled out that kind of time on this sort of course because it's a kind of almost a sprinter's time trial course in a way. Yeah, I mean, it's a uh, flat, it's uh, long, uh, straight roads. It's one for really powerful, fast riders, but still, you know, the kind of distance where a rider who is too powerful might find it too long to shine. So more of a specialist course, I'd say. Theo Gagan Hart, who's riding his first Grand Tour for Team Sky, he did a more than decent time, I think 10 minutes, 3 seconds. Team Sky, as it stands, have got three riders who've done very well. Van Bala, of course, Jonathan Castro Viejo and uh, Gagan Hart. And he was talking at the finish about how basically there was no need to really touch the brakes on the course, um, really only until coming into this uh, bit in the centre of town where it got a, a little bit technical but not really that much. It's been a real a real fast call. You, you know, Castro Viejo, I heard him telling that uh, he had not beaten Van Barle's time by four seconds. Uh, he was telling that the, his, the visor on his helmet, he didn't adjust it well before the TT. So it was moving and he had to touch it several times and he was convinced that he had uh, lost the time trial there. But, uh, you know, he was saying it with no big disappointment. He seemed even happy because, after all, he had then lost to a rival, he had lost to a teammate, and he was taking it very sportingly. Castro Viejo was the European time trial champion a couple of years ago, or three years ago. Um, just to clear up something Daniel and I were talking about earlier, Victor Campanets has been European time trial champion two years in a row. So, well, we knew he was the champion of Europe. He'll be wearing his uh, European Stars jersey when he crosses the line shortly. But Fran, so far, the stars of the day, really. BMC are doing well. Three riders as well who put in very good times. DeMarkey, Tunes and Brent Bookwalter, all within a few seconds of one another. And arguably, they have the favourite today, Rohan Dennis, who could finish the first day of the welter in the red jersey, just as he did last year. Uh, but you spoke to his time trial coach at BMC Racing, Marco Pinotti, back down at the start earlier on. Yeah, and as for the description of the course... Who's best, who's better to tell us what this first time trial of the Vuelta España is really like? Let's hear from him. I'm with a confessed listener of the podcast, Marco Pinotti, time trial guru of the World Tour, at least from my standpoint. And so I came to speak with him because I wanted to find out a technical assessment of the course of this Malaga time trial. Uh, it's quite simple, straightforward course. Maybe you have to put the brakes uh, six times, I would say. Three corners are actually quite tricky. I would say slippery, as usual, is a, a sit down. So the first one is after 1.5 the U turn, and then there's the, the corner into the climb. And then the second to last corner with 1.4k to go. But for the rest, it's a really power course. You have to push and you can keep your head down, go in your, your target power, no, no other issue. The descent is fast, no technical. It's really a good course. And what about the entrance to the light, latest straight line to Calle Larios? Is that the... Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky point because I know we saw the rider there, everybody came here and said, oh, I could have gone faster or I did it uh, small, too, too, too slow. Because this corner in the recon, they need, they need maybe did it twice while they did all the course for time. Because, you know, the corner, the deviation to come back yeah. is, is early before the corner. And then it's... a. Uh, no, it, the corner goes into some ties, which is good, but the ties come start after just the exit of the corner. So with dry road, it's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're already halfway through the time trial, so most of the riders have finished. But still, it's OK to, if we ask you for a bet on who's winning. Well, I'm Italian, I'm Scaramante, so I can give you a bet. <laughs> I expect, you know, you know, Ron Dennis to be there to fight for the win. 
and the other two are, I think, are Castro Viejo and Kiatowski. One last question about the state of Richie Porti. Is he recovered from the gastrointestinal problems? I think he's recovered, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, he didn't have, as he said in the interview, not an ideal approach to, to the weather. But, uh, my opinion is, uh, yeah, you have to, to take it day by day. I mean, uh, anybody is here, he had probably an injury uh, w which was worse than him. So they are maybe in the, in the same position. I think it's, uh, you have to show that uh, he's a fighter. So he doesn't have an ideal approach. And uh, we see day by day. Today was, uh, I was not expecting a big, uh, because with the shoulder injury, he couldn't do any, any time trial training on the TT bike. So he was not happy of his performer, but for me, it was, uh, what I expect today. It was, uh, it was uh, not so bad, not too bad, yeah. After in a cup in a week time, this will be an, this time trial will be an anecdote. After all, yeah, I don't think it will. Uh, the weather is so you know it will be decided on the climate or maybe the next the last time trial will have more importance. But uh, yeah, it will probably have uh, 25 uh, or something second maybe for, for from some of the contender. But he's not here really to fight. But, you know, he's admitted he's not uh, doesn't have the form that he had in the tour. We take by day. The goal is to, to to get better day by day and uh, get the, the finish to Madrid in a good okay. in a good form. So one of your masters just jumped into yeah. the sea. Yeah. Yeah. I promise that if we win, I gonna do this in the hotel, not now. Okay. I go in the swimming pool. That's I cheating. Go, I go back by bike, but then I jump in the sea. Oh, oh no! It's one rider. <laughs> Who's that? Ventoso, Ventoso. The Spaniards yeah. always calling attention. You have to do it only if you have the best time, so he will get a, a, a punishment for this. <laughs> okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you, bye bye. Well, Fran, one man that we've not really talked about today, and it seems like an oversight not to have done so, is Michal Kwiatkowski, Team Sky rider. Looks so strong in the Tour de France, riding for Garant Thomas. Then won the Tour of Poland, his home stage race, of course, and it absolutely smashed Nelson Oliveira's time by 11 seconds. And uh, currently in the hot seat, Victor Campanet has got very close, but a second or so outside Kwiatkowski's time. But what's our assessment of his uh, status in Team Sky? Because he's obviously going very well now. He's obviously going to be a real factor in this opening week, but surely not a contender to win the Vuelta. Well, I think he's done a lot of efforts in the last two months. I mean, July was pretty intense for him. Of course, afterwards, he had to go to Poland and win it. And it, in Poland, even if the climbs are not that long or don't seem that, that tough, it's a very demanding race, a very demanding race to win. And indeed, he had to win it on his own on the last stage, the last kilometers. So a lot of efforts probably will pay for them in the third week. I don't think he will dig too deep with the world in mind but still I expect him to be quite a contender in the first second week I'd be surprised honestly if this first week he didn't get to wear the yellow jersey for at least a couple of days yellow jersey red jersey Fran red jersey police is it isn't there is a yellow jersey here in the Volta I thought they have changed it oh so, sorry sorry only eight, only eight years ago, Fran, when you were probably only a teenager. Yeah, and, it, and it wasn't yellow, it was, it was gold. It was. it was indeed, yes. Um, there was a, talking of jerseys, quite a rare sight there because Peter Sagan came past in an ordinary Bora Hansgrohe skin suit. So rare that we see him wearing his trade team kit. He's got such a choice of jerseys to wear, hasn't he? Yeah, I mean, yesterday I was uh, interviewing Lucas Postelberger in the doorstep of their hotel and people began to crowd the doorstep, you know. It was up to 25, 30 persons that were just waiting for Peter Sagan to come out of the hotel and go to the cooking truck of Bora. You know, it was pretty impressive because after all, you know, Spain, Mar Malaga, Friday night, there was people waiting to see Peter Sagan. That gives you uh, that illustrates the extent of his stardom, you know, how big a star he is for cy in cycling and in sports in general. The Spanish are very hard to impress though, aren't they? You've got to be mm. pretty special if you're not a Spanish cyclist, no? Yeah, right. I mean, Chris Froome, how many autographs has Chris Froome written down in Spanish? No, no, uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're getting right to the sharp end now. The two stories that we need to... Uh, 
tidy up. How do all the GC contenders get on against one another? And does Roman Dennis take the red jersey? Don't forget to listen to our morning show, Kilometer Zero, supported by The Economist. Monday, Wednesday and Friday mornings throughout the Vuelta a España. Well, Fran, we've walked through the city streets. It's coming up to nine o'clock now, quite a late finish for a Grand Tour stage. But really, Spanish cities are only just getting going now, aren't they? Exactly. I mean, if you, if you see around on this on terrace of this barrel, we are having a couple of red Alhambras, one of the finest beers you find in Spain. The tables are not full yet. I mean, peak time for restaurants is 10 p.m., so I think the stage finished a bit early. Well, as we were walking through the, the, the streets here and I was kind of looking at, well, there's some very well-heeled shops here. There's, um, you know, lots of bars and restaurants and really quite impressed by Malaga. But Fran, you were a student here and you were saying that the, the whole city has really transformed itself in the last 10 years. Comparing the current state of the centre of the city of Malaga, besides... My favorite bar having been closed, which is something that has hurt my feelings deeply. City center of Malaga was way darker 10 years ago. It's clear that the city has transformed quite dramatically. They have invested on trying to attract technological enterprise, trying to attract cultural life, and that has had a very big impact. Besides closing for the traffic or wheel traffic, the center of the city has been a brilliant move because all of a sudden, it's cleaner, it's more beautiful, there is more life in here. And it's all pedestrianised in here and yeah it's uh, got a real busy bustling feel. I know it's uh, you know it's a kind of the height of the summer isn't it but um, it's been uh, yeah it's been a lovely day here and well somebody else who will think it's been a lovely day in Malaga is Rowan Dennis, Australian time trial champion as we predicted not the prediction of the century really that Rowan Dennis would win this time trial but he did so pretty convincingly at 9 minutes 39 seconds for the 8 kilometers 6 seconds ahead of Michal Kwiatkowski of Team Sky Victor Campanets with third Nelson Oliveira fourth and Dylan Van Bala who was in the lead for you know most of the day really um, hailed on for fifth place but Rowan Dennis in the red jersey tomorrow not a surprise but now the question is I wonder what kind of welter will open up for him for the coming stages he has a pretty nice landscape before him because uh, tomorrow's stage finish up in Camino del Rey is not as steep and not as hard as the one where Seban Chavez won three years ago if I remember correctly um, then the arrival to our orientator is a sprint finish and Alfaguara even if it is a very beautiful climb and has one very steep kilometer I think it's the kind of climb with which uh, Rohan Dennis can well cope so he can well keep uh, the yellow jersey until La Cobatilla I reckon the red jersey Fran you're going to have to get mm. out of this here I mean, it's not the yellow jersey come on the, the Spanish flag is red and yellow I mean it's a 50% chance of <laughs> being right and in this case I was wrong sorry <laughs> well the, the one thing I would fear for Dennis is that the man on his shoulder is Kwiatkowski who of course is good on little short sharp finishes so um, who knows it could uh, there could be a bit of a battle over the coming days for the leader's jersey whatever colour they decide on um, <laughs> funnily enough th that will be one of the little snippets the history of the leader's jersey will be one of the snippets in Kilometre Zero which is coming on Monday the series is sponsored this year by The Economist very grateful to them for sponsoring Kilometre Zero which means that everyone gets to listen to the episodes uh, for free there'll be nine episodes three per week on monday wednesday and friday mornings uh, the first one is a kind of a, a potted history of the vuelta told by myself richard moore fran and daniel um, so that will be out on monday but looking at the results and just digesting what has happened today a couple of things stand out to me one is that wilco kelderman rode so well today 10th place at 22 seconds and you could say arguably the first of the real GC riders who will be aiming for the podium. Um, Valverde just behind him in 16th place but only two seconds back and another good time trial ride by Simon Yates. 30th position, 29 seconds and Fran we saw Nairo Quintana come round that final bend and you were not so flattering about the line he took around that corner Quintana and I agreed with you I mean it didn't look like the racing line at all and yet 
finished in 34th place, only 30 seconds down. So clearly not going too badly. The rest of the GC riders lost over uh, half a minute to Dennis. Not that that will perhaps be quite so important as the race goes on, but matching up against one another, the kind of the middle of the pack is Miguel Angel Lopez, Fabio Aru and Vincenzo Nibali, and then kind of bringing up the rear, Rigoberto ran 45 seconds down on Rowan Dennis in 80th place. Richie Port, who we knew was going to have a bad day, 51 seconds lost today. And Michael Woods, uh, not a noted time trialist, especially not over short distances but 121st place for him and 59 seconds down which might be a blessing in disguise because it will give him that little bit of extra freedom when the uphill finishes start coming yeah i am pretty interested on seeing what the uh, ef education first rate pack is going to do in this uh, vuelta España because rigobert turan is relatively fresh compared to the rest of the contenders he hasn't put on a very big block of effort this season and uh, he is a solid DC rider. He has showed it time and again. Then they have Michael Boots and a handful of other riders uh, with decent climbing abilities that can well give a surprise to everyone. I really am looking forward to see how it plays out for them. Well, I was at the EF Education First bus briefly this afternoon and uh, there were some Colombian fans around the, uh, the, the tape, around the bus, just sort of craning their necks to try and get a, a glimpse of uh, Rigoberto Uran if he came out of the bus. Uh, always loads of Colombian fans, uh, all of the Grand anywhere, Tour. Anywhere in the world. Yeah, but particularly so here because it's kind of their second home, I guess, you know, share the language and uh, uh, very similar cultures. Um, but... There was one particular Colombian fan in the Colombian football jersey, the yellow football jersey, and he was getting quite irate that Iran was not being uh, brought off the bus by one of the other team staff members. And he was saying, oh, well, you know, we're here for Iran. We want to see Rigoberto. We, we've come all this way. We want to see him. Just get him out of the bus. And it was just getting a little bit uh, not. It was getting to the point where the staff were thinking, do we go over and say something and calm this guy down? Yeah. And then, uh, then Iran came out of the bus with his arms in the air and the whole crowd of them all cheered. Uh, and he had a very kind of uh, nice few minutes, posed for all the photos photographs and uh, the, the guy in the Columbia football jersey was uh, you know basically giving him a whole pet talk all the way through to Madrid I think <laughs> but that's kind of how it is isn't it yeah I mean it's little moments of magic than cycling and the craziness that the Colombian people has showed for the sport give us I mean anywhere any small race you see pictures from from uh, from Colombia it's amazing the amount of crowd there are and the passionate they are about cycling that's something that is completely different to any other country in the world I'd say big crowds here today what um, how what kind of health is the Vuelta in at the moment and and what can we expect from the Spanish riders well the Vuelta España is pretty now pretty stylish now as a, a big event here in Spain uh, the amount of coverage it gets, it's decent. It's not the one that it got maybe 20, 20 years ago in the in this golden age, post enduring era. But right now, it's quite it's all right, I'd say. As for the Spanish riders in this Vuelta, the biggest chance of a GC, Spanish GC rider making it to the top five is David de la Cruz from Team Sky. Besides that, we have the Sagire brothers and... Enric Mas, which is my personal bet for a surprise, either for a stage victory or for a strong GC showing. She's pretty down still, so we can assure that he's going to win the top 10, but his talent is well worth it. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned De La Cruz. I mean, he's had some good performances in Grand Tours before, um, and he's in a Team Sky team that really is... is, is flying below the radar compared to how much pressure and attention is on them when Chris Froome or now Geraint Thomas uh, is riding. So it, it's uh, going to be interesting to see how they race as much as anything because they haven't got the undisputed best rider in the race and the strongest team in the race. They're going to have to kind of you know, do something slightly different to what we normally see Team Sky do. And Enric Mass, you mentioned, had a, a, a good uh, stage race season last year 
and he's now reaching that age, I guess, where the next big step is to um, is to try and finish a, a really good position on GC. But we shall see, and that's what we will uh, will see unfold before our eyes over the next three weeks. And uh, well, it all kind of kicks off tomorrow when they leave from Marbella around about lunchtime, I think, tomorrow. Yeah, around uh, around one thirty. It's a pretty good time to come see the riders take off half a beer, go to the press room, eat, and then watch the race relaxingly. Oh, it sounds marvellous. I mean, uh, one thirty. Marvellous in Marbella. Marvellous yeah. in Marbella, yeah. one thirty is almost, well, it's the morning, isn't it, still in, in Spain? Yeah, I mean, uh, we don't have lunch until 2 p.m. And on Sundays, uh, I mean, on Sundays, every Sunday at my home, we would have lunch at 3 p.m., 3.30 maybe, you know, right in time to finish up have a small siesta and watch a football match at 5pm <laughs> well it sounds absolutely sounds better and better as we go on um, but we will be back tomorrow to talk about stage 2 of the Vuelta until then thank you very much Fran thank you very much Lionel it's going to be a real great Vuelta